This is module 11, and this is a module about cost estimation. And it's going to largely involve a study and a review of how costs behave and how costs are driven by cost drivers. So we'll be looking at the subject today, and some of this will be new for us. And again, some of it will be a good review of the cost different cost behaviors, the variable and fixed and mixed costs that we studied in um, a module much earlier earlier in the course. Let's go back though to the module 10b where we were studying uh, the step method for allocating cost of support services and I will go through uh, the answer I'll go through the answers to the questions that you would find in the for practice at the end of module 10b. Let's take a look at the first question I ask you about uh, the step method, and that was, how is the step method different than the direct method? You'll recall in the direct method that support services costs were only and directly allocated to production departments only. When we use the step method, what we are now recognizing and accounting for is the fact that service departments not only serve production departments, but they also serve other service departments. So what we do is we uh, include that aspect in our calculations, but be reminded that it is only one way. When we have service department A serving service department B, and then B is also serving A, this method will not accommodate the two-way or the reciprocal nature of that, but only one way or one direction. This leads to question number two, how is a reciprocal method, which we just uh, talk about very briefly, um, how is it different than the step method? Well, first of all, it's going to give you a more accurate allocation and more closely represents reality. We talked about how it requires um, matrix algebra simultaneous equations to use this method. But the number one or the main difference between it and the step method is that it recognize the re uh, reciprocity between these service departments, or in other words, the two-way interaction. Let's look at, there was a sample problem put in your for practice. It, I believe the company was simply called Company X. And the next few questions relate to that example. Uh, I ask you which service department will be addressed first or which will be allocated first as we go through the allocation process using the step method. And how do we determine which one goes first? So uh, let me uh, again remind you that in this method, the way we know which service department to start with is we have to compute percentages. What percent of our services are going to production departments? What percentage uh, would be going to other service departments? And the first to be allocated will be that department that provides the most or the largest percentages largest percentage of its services to another service department. So if you did that calculation for the maintenance department and the um, the general factory administrative department, you should have found that 20% of maintenance department work goes to other service to, uh, to another service department. Um, the GFA or the general factory administration, their percentage of work done for another service department was only 16.7%. So the allocation will begin with the maintenance department. Finally, um, as we look at um, this step process, question five asks us, although the general factory administrative department does provide services to the maintenance department, which is another service department, will its cost be allocated to maintenance? Yes or no, and why? 
you'll recall that we were going to start the step method by allocating the cost of the maintenance department. Once you have allocated the cost from a service department, then using this method, you do not go ahead and then allocate the next departments back to that first department because in effect, it is out of the running. So, uh, in, in the case of the General Factory Administrative Department, there will be no cost being allocated to maintenance, even though they did provide services for that department. In this case, uh, the cost will be allocated only to the two production departments. And finally, um, Number six sums this up and says that all costs are ultimately allocated to production departments, in this case, cutting and assembly. And what are the amounts that would be allocated to these two production departments? And the result should be that the cutting department will have $15,520 allocated to it. The assembly department will have $52,000 $480. So as you can see here, when we have allocated to these two departments and add the allocations together, we come up with the 68000 And you will, will recall that this is the total of all service department costs. And of course, they have ultimately landed um, on the backs or on the shoulders of the two production areas. Let's return now to the subject for this module. And again, this being cost estimation and uh, is often defined in textbooks again as the process of estimating the relation or the relations between cost and their cost drivers. As I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a module which really focuses on how costs behave. And so what we will be doing is we will be using what we're going to call the total cost formula. And once we have a total cost formula, it becomes very easy to estimate our cost. And let me um, first talk about, we'll look at that total cost formula and we'll talk about how we derive this formula. But let's just talk in general terms about why organizations or why businesses want to estimate cost. First of all, this is uh, done to help management manage cost. If you think about costs, they just don't occur on their own, but they are activities that are going on in the business that are causing these costs to be incurred. And so if we take a look at what's driving the cost and start managing these activities or these drivers, then it is possible then to manage the cost. We also estimate costs to make decisions. For example, a university may be interested in doubling the size of their student health center. And if this is the case, we must understand the cost structure of the organization in order to predict or estimate if we double the size of this center, what will happen to cost. Now we know that there will be variable cost and fixed cost, and by doubling the size of the center doesn't mean that our cost will double. But with the help of a total cost formula, we will be able to do a good job of estimating those costs in the event that we do uh, go ahead and double the size of that particular building. Let's look at a third reason that organizations estimate cost. They do cost estimation as they plan and as they set standards. So this is part of the budgeting process. Let's go ahead too and move from here to talk about if you're going to have a total cost formula, how is it that um, we come up with such? And to use and benefit from a total cost formula, we have to essentially break down our cost into the costs that behave in a fixed manner and costs that behave in a variable manner. 
And it's really beneficial, I think, if you go back to an earlier module where we were discussing uh, variable and fixed, I think it would be very helpful as we pursue the study in this particular module. So let, let me talk to you about this total cost formula, and let's actually take a look at an example one, and then we will describe how this company came about having such a useful tool. This is what is described as a total cost formula. And let's use an actual example. Let's say this would be uh, manufacturing overhead cost. For, let's use a quarter. So using a total cost formula, I should be able to determine what my overhead costs were going to be for this quarter once I determined the activity level of the cost driver. So I'm going to use the cost driver here to be, for example, units of production. Now let's look at what this uh, cost formula says. Total manufacturing overhead cost for the quarter will be equal to the fixed plus the variable times the activity level of the cost driver, which in this particular example would be units of production. So let me put some numbers here and let's see how this works. If we have fixed cost of 125000 for the quarter for manufacturing overhead, we have variable of 8x. Then once I know that perhaps x equals 10,000 units, for example, then I can estimate what my cost would be if I would be at that level. And you can see how easy that is to do. 125,000 plus 8 times 10,000 gives us 80,000. So I estimate total manufacturing overhead costs for this particular quarter in this situation to be 205,000. Now when we use total cost formulas, we must understand that if any of the terms of this formula change, we are out of the relevant range. So this is a great way to understand the relevant range. The relevant range would be uh, within that level of activity where this 125 and this 8 remains constant. If this changes or if this changes, then we are in a different relevant range. Now let's talk about what we believe to be driving the cost here. We believe that overhead costs are driven by units of production. This becomes our x. Let's talk about the variables here too in a little bit different way. Total cost here is what we're trying to predict uh, for, uh, for manufacturing overhead. Uh, we would call the total cost the dependent variable and we would call the cost driver here, in this case units of production, the independent variable. So the cost driver is always going to be our independent variable and is going to help us determine how much total cost we're going to have and again referring to that as the dependent variable. In order to derive such a cost formula, there are different ways to do that, and some are more sophisticated than others. But the most common way to do this is to run a regression analysis. And when we do that, what we're trying to do is develop a formula similar to the one that you just saw, which will um, give us an idea of where our fixed costs are, or how much our fixed costs are, and then how much our costs are going to vary on a, on a per unit basis, which would be, again, the variable aspect of the total cost. If we look at the graph here that I'm building, we would have um, our independent variable here. This was the x, the units of production on the horizontal axis, and we would put our overhead cost here and these, this would be, of course, our dependent variable. So independent variable, 
dependent variable. And to um, come up with this cost formula, we would keep data and we would keep data based on two things. What were our overhead manufacture our manufacturing overhead cost for a period and how many units of production were associated with that same period. So you would be keeping data. Um, it would be nice to keep as many as to get as many as 30 data points. That may be difficult to do and I won't be drawing that many. But what we're going to do is keep track of, again, each period, what were my manufacturing overhead costs in total, and how many units were being produced in that same period. So you're going to end up with data points. And so forth. And what, um, what we can do is run a statistical program called regression. And what this regression is going to do is going to find what they call the line of best fit. And it's going to show us where the fixed costs are going to be in terms of where this line crosses the y-axis. This is called the y-intercept and this gives us fixed cost. And the slope of this line will be called the variable or will relate to the variable cost. So from this we can uh, develop a total cost formula. Now if you look at what I just drew, this is probably um, not a good representation of the numbers we used because we had quite a bit of fixed cost and if you look at the way this was drawn, the fixed cost is right here, again where we cr cross the y-axis. And so this particular picture probably doesn't fit, fit that formula. This one may be something more like total cost equals uh, a very low amount of fixed cost, 25000 plus something times x. But this was just drawn to give you an example of what that regression uh, approach does. It takes our data points, it tries, it does find the line of best fit where it minimizes the difference or the distances between the line and all the dots. And again, mine being drawn by hand may uh, be certainly less than accurate. Over here we have a data point which sometimes when we collect data we have to refer to it as an outlier and we might include it in the data. In this case perhaps I checked it out and it truly was either bad data or a very unusual month and I choose to eliminate it from uh, the analysis. So this is what the regression will produce is a graph such as this. Now the regression report or the um, output from running the regression instead of saying total cost equals fix plus variable times x it will say y equals a plus bx. So this is in essence what we saw before, the variable times the cost driver. And this being the y-intercept for the fixed, and this being the slope of the line. And finally, when we run a regression, we are going to end up with a number or um, an output called r-squared. And the R squared is simply going to tell us what percent of the change in total cost was caused by changes in X or the cost driver. In our example, if R squared were 62 percent, this would tell us that 62 percent of the change in total cost was can be explained by the change in the number of units of production. If this were something as low as 12, this would say 12 percent of the change in total manufacturing cost can be explained by the change in units of production. 
Now, an R square of 0.12 would tell us that we haven't chosen a very good cost driver. So we would either want to add additional cost drivers, which would move us into what we call multiple regression, or perhaps we would just like to try a different one. Uh, but of course, the higher R squared, then the more of the changes that are being explained by this cost driver that we have identified. Let's go through now a five-step process that we would use if we were interested in developing a cost formula using regression. Step number one, you would have to choose the most reasonable cost driver or cost drivers that you could come up with. It's a very important step that you choose uh, something appropriate. And of course, when our R square comes out, we're going to know how appropriate that cost driver really was. Step two, you're going to gather data. And as I mentioned before in our example, you would gather data for each period, what were total overhead cost and what were the units of production for each of those periods. Uh, step number three was what you saw me do uh, in my hand-drawn graph. You're going to plot this data and you can use Excel to do this and it'll do a much nicer job than I did. But you're going to want to plot the data on a scatter graph because th through uh, the um, analysis of this particular scatter graph you would be able to identify your outliers and then could follow up about those. Step number four would be to run the regression. Again, um, a st a statistical software can be used for that, and they're very user-friendly these days. Step number five would be interpreting the results, and the results would be in the form of that formula that said y equals a plus bx. It would also, again, give us information about the appropriateness of our cost driver in terms of the r squared. As is often the case when we collect data, sometimes there will be some problems we have to deal with. But generally speaking, uh, when we collect this data, it would be very good to have a minimum of 30 data points. Uh, we will have to make sure uh, that the data that we're collecting, that there's a consistency. Uh, we would also have to probably deal with missing data in some cases. We've already talked about outliers, and we don't want to immediately throw out those data points that appear to be outliers, but we do want to investigate and see um, if they truly are outliers. And of course, you have issues such as inflation. If you're collecting data for a long period of time, then you've, you may have some inflationary effects. But overall, Using regression to develop this cost formula can have great benefits for the company in terms of cost estimation. And so to conclude this module, let's just be reminded again that when we are given a cost formula, this allows us to uh, begin to manage our costs because we know how they behave and we've identified the cost drivers that are appropriate. Secondly, it allows us to make decisions. And thirdly, it allows us to plan ahead. And this is going to be um, very evident to us as we move into our study of, bud of budgets in a future module. We'll actually be picking this subject up again at that point.